welcome to Fairview Baptist Church Online. Thank you for joining with us today. He became sad, who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and He carried the So much Lord that he builds our life. So let him build your life as we continue to sing.
Sing praises. You ever thought about being able to do that 10,000 times?
Lord, we do worship his holy name. We worship it so much. And we want him to get all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. So pray with me now as we get ready to hear a word from Brother Ben. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you. We come expecting you to speak to our hearts. Touch us with the mighty power of your word. Dissect in us your very spirit so that we can be more like you as we walk away today. We ask this in Jesus' name. So let's welcome Pastor Bill as he comes to speak in Jesus' name. Brother Bill, come on. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, my joy to be with all of you this morning, sweet people. Uh, I'm thankful for the privilege today to share with you God's wonderful Word. And <clears throat> this past weekend, we were celebrating and and remembering Memorial Day. And it's always a festive weekend that marks the end of a school year, usually, and the beginning of summer. But it's also a somber weekend in the sense that we remember those men and women who, given their lives, that we may enjoy the freedom and the liberties that we enjoy in this beautiful land called America. <clears throat> but in the middle of this Memorial Day weekend, something happened Sunday night that disturbed our wonderful community, Durant, Oklahoma. It upset our equilibrium for the whole weekend. Four of our high school students, four teenagers, were sitting at a red light, minding their own business, tending to business, doing what they were supposed to be doing. And then a man came up behind them at a high rate of speed in a pickup and hit them in the rear end. It was a powerful collision. And sadly, all four of those high school teenagers lost their lives. Four wonderful boys, four wonderful athletes. And it has rocked the soul of our community, Durant, Oklahoma. It's a tough thing to deal with. It's tragic. And when things happen like this, it rocks our souls. We want to cry out and, and ask why and how could this happen and what could have been done differently so that this didn't happen. And so it is a soul-wrenching incident in the life of our community collectively and in the lives of those parents and families and friends and students at the Durant High School. And, and I want to think about this today. I want to think about the implications of something like this and how we deal with it from the perspective of God's Holy Word. And if you'll take your Bible this morning and find Romans the 8th chapter, Romans chapter 8, I want to speak to you on the subject of our groaning planet, Romans chapter 8 this morning. I'll give you a moment to get there. I want to speak to us this morning on the subject of our groaning planet. And uh, my church family is uh, exceedingly familiar with uh, my teachings and sharing uh, in this area of Scripture because I have studied for a long time about suffering on this, this uh, often wonderful place called planet Earth. And I want to begin this morning in Romans the 8th chapter in verse 18. And I just for a moment want to go Scripture by Scripture and speak about what God is saying to us beginning in verse 18. Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In that verse, it's like Paul pulled out a set of scales in which you weigh something, and he's weighing the huge amount of sufferings that we experience and endure on this planet, like what happens uh, last Sunday night. 
he's comparing that with the future glory of life in God's kingdom, in God's heaven, for those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And look again what he says. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us in due season. And then in verse 19 he says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Paul is describing planet earth and all the trees and, and all the animals, all the monkeys and the giraffes and the cows and the, the seagulls and the pelicans and, and all of God's creation is eagerly saying to God, God, when will it happen? God, when will your kingdom come into place? When will this planet be changed? And then in verse 20, Paul says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him, that is God, who subjected it. And that word futility means out of whack, meaning that God did something to cause planet Earth not to work in the way that He originally intended to, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But God did something in response to man's sin. And then at the end of verse 20, the Bible says, In hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Because planet earth is under the slavery of corruption. You can set a brand new pickup in a, in a garage. Uh, and, and leave it there, never drive it, never touch it, never do anything to it. And it will just slowly rust and fall apart because we live on an earth that has been subjected to the slavery of corruption because of man's sin. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. I've been in a room where a woman's suffering the pains of childbirth. I was there when both of my children were born. I was right there with my wife. And I can tell you, the pains of childbirth are severe. They'll get your attention. <laughs> it sure got my attention. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Standing there with my bride as she gave birth to our two beautiful children. The Bible says here that the creation is suffering the pains of childbirth together until now. The whole creation groans because of sin, and we suffer pain. Verse 22, for we know, excuse me, verse 23, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Praise be to God. I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm waiting eagerly when He comes again and brings in His eternal kingdom, and we live in that kingdom forever and ever where there's no sin and no death and no pain and no problems. I can't wait for that day to come. And then in verse 24, for in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he already sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible teaches here that we live on a groaning planet, that the planet was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. Verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans. And I can tell you that there's a lot of groaning in Durant, Oklahoma, right now, because of four young men who lost their lives unexplicably for no reason. I want to think about it for a moment. I want to think about the fact that we live on a groaning planet, and I want to share three or four 
truths for you today and for us today to think about. And that is first of all, number one, we live on a groaning planet. The Bible says here that God subjected the planet to futility in verse 20. Let me tell you what that means. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, He created a beautiful garden called Eden. And in that garden, when He created man, and then He fashioned woman and brought her to the man, in that garden, He planted them to live forevermore. They were built to live throughout all of eternity. The garden was a perfect place. It was a beautiful place. It was lush. It was green. It was fruitful. There was no evil. There were no viruses. There was no death in the garden. And in that garden, God planted a multitude of things, but he planted two trees. One is a tree of life. It was there. And then also was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, he told Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, you can eat all the fruit that's in this garden freely, but do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you do, you will die. God said, enjoy it all. Just leave that tree alone. I've often wondered why God had those two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there in the garden. And I'll tell you why he put that tree in there. Because you see, God is creating a kingdom of people who love him of their own volition, of their own free will. And love, by its very nature, to, in order for it to be real, it has to have the freedom not to love. In order for man to be voluntarily obedient to God because we love God, man has to, by nature, have the freedom to rebel against God. And so he put a tree in that garden so that Adam and Eve had the, had the incredible gift of free will. Free will. Well, as the Bible teaches, the old serpent came into the garden and began to tempt Eve and Eve began to look at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she saw that its fruit was good for a number of things, and especially to make one wise. And she partook of the forbidden fruit. Later, when Adam came along, she gave him some of the fruit, and he ate it as well. And then sin entered the world because they disobeyed God. And when sin entered the world, it came through one man, and now it's passed to all men, because now today all men are sinners. And so after that event, God was interacting with them, and He began the process of removing them from that beautiful garden, because sin had come into the world. And in His judgment of that sin, He did something in Genesis 3. The Bible teaches that He cursed the earth. He cursed the earth. And so when he did that, he subjected the earth to futility, which means that because of man's sin, earth and everything in and around it is kind of out of whack. It don't work just right. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, that's called original sin. And then when God cursed the earth, the earth fell, and we call that the fall. The fall. And so things are out of whack. For instance, uh, consider earth itself. You can have a beautiful beach down in South Texas, and, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, a beautiful beach on a sunny day, and the surf is gentle and peaceful and inspires uh, tranquility and wholeness. That same scene can erupt with a, a violent hurricane that will bring a wall of destruction and death in its wake. Consider humans. The land, Germany, that gave us Beethoven and Bach is the same land that gave us Hitler and Goering. Consider America, a land rooted in the Bible precepts of liberty and freedom and civil rights, is also the land that gave us slavery. So we see that the earth is out of whack. We see that human beings are out of whack. There's good and there's bad because we live on an earth that's been subjected to futility. 
futility. And as a result, we live on a groaning planet. And here's what I want us to know today is that the basis of life on earth is tragedy. Yes, life is wonderful upon earth. Life is good so much of the time. This past weekend, many people were having a good time. But then Sunday night, something happened and our good time was disrupted in a horrible, horrible way. Because we live on an earth subjected to futility. The basis of life on this earth is tragedy. Tragedy. You know, I was growing up in Lubbock, Texas, and I was standing in my father's garage on May the 11th, 1970. And we were watching a, a violent thunder, thunderstorm coming toward us out there from the west, the southwest. And as we stood there, we, we watched in amazement, in horror, really, as three giant tornadoes went by in front of us. And they, they exploded all over downtown Lubbock, and downtown Lubbock was, was uh, literally almost destroyed. It was tore up. But downtown, there was a great church there, and the church was completely obliterated. The church was. And so what we, what we learn in that event is that, is that, listen to me, we live on a groaning planet where even Christians suffer in this out-of-whack rotating globe. We just have to realize it. It is a groaning planet because of sin. And then here's a second thing that I want us to think about, and that is this. Most suffering on earth is because of human free will. Let me give an example. God created the tree. I love trees. And I love the tree in general because you know what? A tree is, is very useful. It's part of God's intelligent design for us. You can look at a tree and it gives beauty. You can lie under the shade of a tree and cool off on a hot summer day. The tree uh, gives uh, oxygen back into the atmosphere. And then you can cut the tree down. And you can refine the, the, the wood and you can build a house out of it. You can cut the tree down and, and start a fire in your fireplace on a cold winter evening and enjoy the tranquility and the beauty and the warmth of that fire. You can take that tree, cut it down and, and refine it. And you can make paper out of it and print the Bible on it. You can take that tree and cut it down and carve it just right and create a baseball bat and play baseball and have a lot of great fun just with a single tree. But I'll tell you something else. A miscreant can come along and take that tree, take a branch and carve it into a club and go to his neighbor and hit his neighbor over the head with it and kill him. And kill him. That's called free will. <clears throat> That's called free will. <clears throat> you know, I'm just thinking about this a little bit here today. And, and <clears throat> my heart is burdened today, beloved. I'm thinking about a man by the name of Stephen White. He was the daughter, excuse me, he was the son of Dr. Jerry White and, and his wife Mary. And Dr. White served as a director of the Navigators. And this is a group of people that have served the Lord Jesus night and day at great risk to share the good news that Jesus saved sinners all over the world. And Stephen White was going to college and he was in Colorado Springs and he had a part-time job as a taxi cab driver. One night he picked up a fare. The man got in the back of the taxi, and as they were going down the road, this man pulled out a pistol and shot Stephen White, and he died. Shot him, and he died. Later, the police asked him, what were you doing? And the criminal said, I had just made up my mind that I would get in a taxi cab, and, and whichever one picked me up, I would shoot the driver. It was random. It was brutal. No purpose whatsoever. And, and when something like that happens, we just cry out, what is going on? Why? What is happening? 
How could this happen, especially to the son of a couple like Dr. White and his wife, Mary? How could this happen? Well, think about this for a moment. Let's say that uh, <clears throat> there was a museum that had all of Picasso's best paintings on display. All of the great artist Picasso's paintings on display. And let's say that a miscreant broke into the museum and he took red paint and he splashed it all over those paintings and he ruined that beautiful creation of Picasso. Can I tell you something? We cannot judge Picasso and his creative ability. We cannot judge the goodwill of Picasso and the desire to bless human beings with his art. We cannot judge Picasso because of the evil of a miscreant who goes into the museum and ruins the paintings out of mischief. And can I suggest to us today, we cannot judge God because of the miscreants upon this earth doing what they should not be doing because of human free will, they hurt or even kill another human being. And, and, and beloved, I want to encourage us today. <clears throat> Let us not judge or be angry or hurt at God because of what happened Sunday night, because we don't know all the details yet, but, but so far it seems like this man who hit those four boys, he was not tending to business. He was at a high rate of speed when he should have been uh, nearly at a dead stop. He was doing something he shouldn't have been doing, and these four boys lost their lives. But let us not blame or be angry with God because of what a human being with his free will destroyed. Sunday night. Let us instead draw near to God, who is the only one who can comfort us and get us through this time of tragedy upon this earth. And then thirdly, the third thing that I want to share with us today about this groaning planet that we live on, a planet that is subjected to futility, a planet that is groaning for release, a planet where the creation is looking for the second coming of Christ and for God to, re to remake the heaven and the earth. The planet can't wait for that. Where even those who are the adopted children of God through faith in Jesus, we are looking eagerly for the time when Jesus comes again and when God brings His kingdom here and He changes this earth. He makes a new heaven and a new earth. We cannot wait. Can you today? <laughs> I know you must feel as I do. I, I grow weary of the suffering upon this earth, and I'm looking for that day. And here's a third thing that I would share with us today, and that's this. Faith must be tough. Listen. On this earth, which is fallen, things will just go awry for no reason. No purpose. No reason. I mean, right now, we have been in a time of social distancing because of a, an errant virus let loose upon the earth, and we didn't know how bad it was or what it was going to do or how, bad it would, how far it would spread or how deadly it would be. Thank God we seem to be getting a handle on this thing so that we can get back to work. But we live on a place where there is threat to us. And in that threat, faith in God and faith in Jesus must be tough. You know, last December something happened that uh, I've been pondering every sin, ever since. And I was not directly related, but, but by extension as an American I was related. And so I grieved for some families. But it was three days after Christmas, the 28th of December, 2019. It was to be a festive day. A day in which there was a, a lot of American joy and football and Christmas celebration and packages and gifts and family and food. And it was a festive atmosphere. And on this particular day in Atlanta, Georgia, it was planned for the Louisiana State University Tigers to play football against the University of Oklahoma in the Peach Bowl. And the winner of this important game would advance to the national championship. 
It was a big deal. Everybody was looking forward to it. And, and being from Oklahoma, living in Oklahoma, I was sure looking forward to it. And being a strong fan of the Tigers, I was looking forward to it as well. <laughs> both teams, both of them my team, which everyone won, I won, you know. Big day. But I want to tell you something. That morning in Lafayette, Louisiana, six people got on an airplane to fly to that game. They got on a good twin-engine airplane to head out to Atlanta. One of the persons on that plane was Carly McCord. Carly was a, a vibrant, beautiful, newly married, up-and-coming sportscaster, soon to have national acclaim and national recognition. She was the in-home sports broadcaster for the New Orleans Saints and also the New Orleans Pelicans. New Orleans Pelicans. And she got on that airplane. It's recorded that she sent a text to her husband just before she got on the airplane. Her husband is Stephen Insminger, Jr. Just so happens that his father, Stephen Insminger, Sr., was the offensive coordinator of the Louisiana State University Tigers. He was in Atlanta, Georgia, getting ready for the football game against the Sooners. Well, Carly got on the airplane. The airplane took off. It climbed normally and rapidly to about 900 feet. And then suddenly it just started a, a shallow left turn and a, and a pretty regular descent until at one point it came down near earth, went through some high line wires and hit some other things and crashed. Crashed out in front of a, I think it was a, a post office or something out there. It crashed. All but Five of the six people on the plane died, including Carly McCord. The festive day was turned into tears. Laughter was turned into grief. In a split second, earth erupted with a problem of death. In a split second, all of our anticipation and joy was turned into sadness. I will never forget the tears of Stephen Insminger, the offensive coordinator of LSU, when he took the sideline, when he took the field, because he had the news from his son that his daughter-in-law daughter had been tragically killed on that, on that plane crash that morning. <clears throat> Beloved, there will be times upon this earth when things will simply go awry. There will be times on this earth where things will go wrong because it is a groaning planet. It is subjected to futility. There will be times on this earth when we will kind of go through a membrane and our world is rocked and we want to say, why, 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 Father God, why? And here's something that I want to tell you. We have to be careful with the why question. It is possible that God might answer that question. It is more probable that God will not rush in to explain things to us. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 25 in verse 2. That it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. And Beloved, listen to me. God is magnificent. God is so full of love I cannot describe His love. I can only tell you the demonstration of His love is seen in the cross of Jesus Christ where God sacrificed His own dear Son. He was nailed to a tree with six-inch Roman spikes. They put a sword in His side. God judged your sins and my sins and the body of His Son Jesus so that by His stripes our wounds are healed and by His sacrifice our sins can be forgiven. I can only tell you that God God loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus for you. But we got to understand the power of that three letter word sin. Sin rocked the world. And because man sinned, our world gets rocked sometimes. I think often about Carly's husband, Stephen Insminger Jr. I don't know him. Wish I did, but I don't know him. But I think often about him. His grief is so palatable, you can almost feel it when you see him on the TV or 
when he posts something on Facebook, you can feel his grief. And I just feel for them. I feel for them. Beautiful woman, Stephen White, a wonderful young man in the prime of life, four teenagers minding their own business, and suddenly we experience this groaning planet, and we groan. Faith has to be tough in this situation. All I can tell you is that we got to be tough in our belief in God. Do you hear me today? It's in these situations that our faith is proven. James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for when he is approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. And you see, in these situations, there is something where God sees if our love is genuine. Everybody would love God if all God did was make everything wonderful for us. But the question is, is our faith fair weather faith or is our faith of the real substance that can withstand all that this groaning planet can throw our way. And still, Mr. Devil, you will not take my faith in Jesus' name. You see, sometimes you're going to go through uh, an invisible membrane and your life can fall apart. And in that moment, you will begin to think that God somehow betrayed you. We all go through it when there's a time that we feel like God was somewhere else when my trouble came. God, where are you, Father? And it's in those moments that we are most vulnerable. Because the old devil, that old spiritual enemy we have, Satan, a liar and a deceiver, every thought is a lie, every word that comes out of his mouth is an evil, deceptive snarky lie and when you're in that vulnerable place he'll speak to you and he'll say see God don't love you he'll say see God's not real he'll say see God allowed that to happen to you and it's at that moment friend your faith needs to be tough it's at that moment that you need to say to the devil, be gone in the name of Jesus. Because this thing hurts real bad. But please understand this. My God is on his throne. My King Jesus is on the throne next to him. And my King is coming again. And I will not lose my faith in this situation in the mighty name of Jesus. And then the fourth and final thought that I would share with us today is this. <clears throat> Paul said in verse 18, he said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And then down in verse 24 and 25, he said, in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? We don't see the kingdom with our physical eyes yet. We do with our spiritual eyes, God's kingdom. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, stick to we wait eagerly for it. What Paul is saying is that our hope is in future glory. And that's the fourth thought, the fourth truth I want us to think about today. Our hope is in future glory. If you're listening to me today and you, and you, don't, you don't believe in God or you don't know Jesus, but, but you are curious, you, you're wondering about life, you're hurt. You've seen some of this tragedy. You've experienced it. You wonder, what's it all about? I just want to share with you, I love you very much. God knows your pain. He knows you. I just want to share with you that what you need 
is a biblical world view. There's only two world views that a person can have. One is biblical and then all others. All others are wrong. There is no counsel and there is no wisdom against God. You need a biblical world view. The Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, the best instructions before leaving earth. You need a world view that's rooted in the truth of God's holy word. And here's what I want to tell you. There's a reason that we're suffering and it's because man has sinned. There's a reason we have tragedy. It's because man has sinned. There's a reason that this beautiful, beautiful earth erupts into pain and heartache. And it's because we have sinned. Let me tell you something, our hope is in what God has done. Our hope is in what He's going to give us in the future. And that is future glory. And then you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just as I shared with you a moment ago, God so loved you that He sacrificed His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth in the form of a man. He lived perfectly and He died on a cross And on that cross, he died, not simply to die. He died to give his life as a payment for your sins. He shed his blood as a payment, an atonement for your sins and my sins. So that whosoever believes in him with repentant faith, meaning you want to turn from your sins and you come to faith in Jesus, God will give you forgiveness. He will reconcile you to Himself. He will adopt you and make make you a child in His family. And friend, when you die, you'll go to heaven instead of hell. We're going to die. But Here's something you need to know. One moment after you die, you're going to be very much alive. Death is not to cease to exist. Death is a separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. And you're going to be very much alive because this body made just for this earth has to be changed to go into heaven one day. But you're going to leave this body, but you're going to be alive and you're going to one of two destinations. You either go into that place, which is preparation for hell, it's Hades, man, or you're going to go to paradise. And our hope, For those of us who know Jesus, is that when we leave this earth, we're going to a temporary home called paradise. Well, where do you get that word, Brother Bill? Well, that's what Jesus called it when he was hanging on the cross. When he saved the criminal next to him, he said, today you shall be with me in paradise. And what that means is this, is that the person who leaves this earth, who knows Christ when they die, When they go through the valley of the shadow of death, they go to paradise, a place that is a beautiful, beautiful, cultivated, garden-like, lush, plentiful, safe, healthy, beautiful, eternal place. The Bible reveals it's our temporary destination. You see, heaven is a created place. God dwells there not because He has to, but because He chooses to. Heaven is created. It has a past, a present, and a future. God created heaven like He did everything else. And the present heaven is our temporary destination. I like to call it our layover destination. If you're a Christian and you know Christ and you die, you're going to a layover destination where you're going to be very much alive in a place called paradise. Where Jesus is making your mansion and where God is making the New Jerusalem a, an incredible city. And when I say layover destination, you're going to be in that temporary place until God makes the new heaven and new earth, and then you're going to live there forevermore. That's your final destination if you know Christ. It's like when you get on an airplane and you want to fly to Hawaii from Dallas. So many times you have to lay over in Los Angeles. To catch another plane, that's your layover destination. Well, the temporary heaven is the Christian's layover place until the final new heaven and new earth 
that God makes where you and I will live forever and forever and forever. Do you hear me today? That is the worldview that's according to the truth of God's holy word. It's to live forever with God in his home. <clears throat> Can I tell you something? I have a mansion in heaven. And can I tell you something? If you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you have a mansion in glory. <clears throat> because Jesus said, He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house, there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. <clears throat> Man, I got a mansion in glory. <laughs> if you know Jesus, you got a mansion awaiting you in glory. If you know Jesus, you have two citizenships. You're a citizen of the country in which you live, but you're also a citizen in the kingdom where you're going. Hallelujah. Because Paul said in Philippians 3.20, he said, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we await the Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. I love that. I'm a citizen in this great land called America, but praise be to God and thanks to Jesus, my Savior, I have a citizenship in God's permanent home. Hallelujah. And here's what I want to share with you today, and that's this. Yes, we suffer here. Yes, we're suffering in Durant, Oklahoma. Yes, they're suffering in Louisiana. And they're suffering all around this world. But let me tell you something. We are encouraged. We are strong. We are standing firm. We're going to get through this. We're going to another side over here. We're going to another day because our hope is in future glory, not in this rust bucket that we call earth that God is going to remake one day. Hallelujah. Our hope is in future glory. <clears throat> and I close with this. <clears throat> one of my favorite authors is Johnny Erickson Tata, who's paralyzed from the neck down, who loves Jesus with all of her heart. She's a wonderful author. She's a wonderful artist. She, she paints with a brush in her teeth and creates beautiful uh, pieces of artwork, beautiful paintings, a beautiful person. She told a story about a time when she is a quadriplegic was, was at a retreat for people who had handicaps. And she was there to minister to them and talk with them about Jesus and encourage them in God's ways. And so they were coming to the end of the camp and throughout the week they had heard from all the campers, everybody except one. And as they were having their closing ceremonies, they allowed the, the microphone to be open and someone could come and say a word or whatever, whatever. And so some of the campers would come and say a word to the other campers. And, and finally, this one boy got up. He's a boy who had and has Down syndrome. And everybody was thrilled that he got up and made his way <laughs> to the microphone. Because they wanted to hear from him. Because you see, he hadn't said anything all week. <laughs> he took the microphone and brought it up to his lips. And he said, I miss daddy. Let's go home. That's all he said. The place erupted in applause. And what he was saying was, he said, I, I, I've had a great time. I've enjoyed being with you. But I miss daddy. Let's go. Go home. Friend, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because if you do, if you do, when you come to that place when you're going to die and leave this earth, it's going to be like that little boy said, I miss my daddy. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to see my father. I'm ready to see my Lord. And you'll walk through that valley in victory into the very arms of the King, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Now, He's wired us so that we're not 
we're not ready necessarily to go today. He's wired us to persevere, to live life here. But when the day comes and you're coming to death's canyon, if you know Christ, he's, war he's wired you so that you're ready to say, let's go home. Are you ready? I don't mean you're ready to leave earth today. I mean, are you ready for death? Have you met Jesus? Have you asked Christ to save you from your sins? Listen to this one thing. Today's not guaranteed. You may have gotten up this morning and put on your shoes, but tonight the funeral director will take your shoes off and you've left this earth. Do you know Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord? If not, would you ask Him in a simple prayer with a heart that wants to turn from your sin? And I feel led to tell you, it's something you have to do. The fact that your uncle was a pastor or that your cousin goes to a church somewhere doesn't do anything for you. You have to repent of your sins and you have to ask Jesus to save you and then you dedicate your life to serve Him all the days of your life. Would you come to Christ today, right now? Would you bow your heads? And would you just pray a simple prayer in your own words, in your spirit, just something like, Father God, I come to you and I'm a sinner, God. And I don't understand everything, but, but I know right now that I need salvation. I need to be saved. I need Jesus. I need forgiveness of my sins. And today, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe in Him. I want to know Him. Would you pray that simple prayer and ask God to forgive you? Ask Him to forgive you. Make the commitment that you will turn from sin by His power. Would you ask Him, please forgive me of my sins, God, through Jesus Christ, your Son. And in your own words, ask Him to save you right now. And listen, friend, if you pray to receive Christ as your Savior today, uh, in a moment you'll see some contact information to let us know that you made that commitment today. Or let us know what's happening in your life. Get in touch with us. But I want to tell you this. If you made that commitment to come to Christ today, you need to tell someone. You need to find a church that's preaching the Word of God, lifting up Jesus and loving the people. There's no perfect churches, no perfect people. Just a church that's doing the right things, lifting up Jesus, preaching the Word. Get in touch with a pastor there. He won't be perfect either, but get in touch with him. Let him know what's going on because somebody needs to teach you how to walk with the Lord from this point on. Will you do that? And uh, I just want to tell you as we close, I love you, and I've enjoyed being with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.